Belisarius sailed away from Italy in 540, having brought the entire Italian peninsula into Justinian's empire. But while Italy was under Roman control, it was far from pacified. Justinian made a pretty significant mistake at this time in that he did not appoint a governor of Italy or a general to be the supreme commander of his forces. He simply left Italy in the hands of the generals that were already stationed there. For example, Bessus controlled Rome, Constantianus was in Ravenna, and the other generals held their own localized territory. There was no one man holding it all together, which meant that there was no real accountability in Italy and no centralized plan. Everyone was looking out for themselves, and this led to pillaging and theft from the Italian people who were already worn down by the war. And to make matters worse, Justinian almost immediately sent tax collectors to squeeze as much money as he could out of his shiny new territory. Justinian's tax collectors were ruthless. Poor citizens, aristocrats, soldiers, they all had to pay up. And of course, everyone was looking for a way to pocket money for themselves. The tax collectors and senior military officials in Italy concocted a plan to line their own pockets even further. Salary in the Roman army was tied to service time and rank. Rookies were paid very little, but as you got more and more experience and moved up the pecking order, you got more and more cash. Men near retirement would have made the most money. But around this time, officials started gaming the system. When men higher up the ranks retired or were killed, their names were left on the rolls. That pay would then be siphoned off into the pockets of the tax collectors, or a corrupt general, or some other bureaucrat. And meanwhile, the guys at the lower rungs of the ladder couldn't be promoted because these phantom soldiers still held those higher ranks on the books. Now, this wasn't always the case. It's not like every single death or retirement was hidden, but it happened enough for people to notice, and they weren't happy about it. And this opened a door for the defeated Ostrogoths. They still had men scattered across northern Italy, and they weren't ready to accept rule from Constantinople. Remember, they surrendered to Belisarius and had hoped that he would rule over them by accepting their offer only to turn around and sail back to the east, Belisarius had angered them. Many Ostrogothic nobles then turned to Uriah's, the nephew of Vitiges, to take up the Ostrogothic cause. Uriah's, though, refused the crown, and the Ostrogoths then turned to Ildabad, a general in Verona, who was the nephew of Theudas, the king of the Visigoths. Ildabad accepted the crown, and when he learned that Belisarius had left Italy, he immediately began making trouble for the Romans. He initially commanded only around 1,000 men, but gathered reinforcements from cities in northern Italy, even counting among his ranks dissatisfied mercenaries who had fought for the Romans under Belisarius. If the Roman army wasn't treating them well, maybe the Ostrogothic army would treat them better. And again, this is where a lack of singular Roman command plays another role. Because most of the generals across Italy just ignored this threat that was building in the north, because hey, that's someone else's problem. Eventually, the general Vitalius decided that a move had to be made, and he led his own forces north but was decisively defeated at the Battle of Terbasium. And suddenly, the Romans had lost all control of Italy north of the Po. With this success, Ildabad gained in popularity, but Uriah's, who you'll remember was the first choice of the Ostrogothic aristocrats, still commanded tons of support. 
so a rivalry did begin to develop between these two. Procopius tells us that, at one point, the wives of the two men met face to face, and Uriah's wife condescended to the new queen, who was apparently not dressed very lavishly. Ildabad did not have the wealth of Uriah's family, and had also lost a lot over the course of the war up to this point. But still, his wife was the queen, and that kind of disrespect can't be tolerated. So Uriah's was soon killed on Ildabad's orders. Ildabad's official reasoning for the order was an accusation that Uriah's had conspired with the Romans and would soon be betraying his brethren to them. And it's possible that this was true. But at the same time, Uriah's was the only one who could really challenge Ildabad for the throne, and the tension between the wives probably drove this point home at least a little bit. So there were probably a few factors at play here. But if Ildabad hoped that this would solidify his grip on power, he was sorely mistaken. Uriah's was very popular, and this move actually made Ildabad quite a few enemies. As these enemies started talking, it prompted action from a man named Velas, one of the king's guards, who had previous reason to dislike Ildabad. Velas was a Gepid, and a veteran of the Gothic War. Before the war, he had fallen deeply in love with an Ostrogothic woman, but while he was off fighting the Romans, Ildabad had married this woman off to one of the nobles friendly to him. So, Velas was ticked, to say the least. And now that many of the other men were just as ticked as he was, he recognized an opportunity. One evening, in May of 541, while Ildabad enjoyed his dinner in the royal palace, all of his guards, including Velas, were standing at attention in the banquet hall. At one point, the king stood and reached for more food for his plate. But by this time, he had consumed quite a bit of wine, and the effects were showing. The king staggered, barely able to keep his balance, and Velas took the chance. He approached the king, drew his sword, and decapitated him, right there in the banquet hall. It's said that Ildabad's head rolled away while his dead body was still clutching the food that he had grabbed before he collapsed. The other guards looked the other way on this, and Vilas was never punished. Now the throne was once again vacant, and it was filled by Uraric. Sort of. Uraric was a Rugian, and the Rugians were a small Germanic tribe who were subjects of the Ostrogoths in Italy. But they remained largely separate from the Ostrogoths not ever really intermarrying with them. Uraric had been a respected soldier in the Ostrogothic army, but he never really had the full support of the Ostrogothic nobility. There were many that never recognized him as their king. But still, he did wield enough power to call an Ostrogothic assembly together to try to broker a peace with Justinian. This assembly agreed to send an offer to the emperor restoring the proposed peace of 540. The Ostrogoths would control the land north of the Po, and the Romans would take everything to the south. The proposal was sent eastward, but Uraric added one little curveball to the mix. He sent along a note to Justinian, explaining his willingness to surrender everything in return for money and safe haven in Constantinople. Meanwhile, over in Tarbasium, the Ostrogothic garrison prepared to surrender after hearing of the death of Ildabad. They contacted Constantianus in Ravenna and made arrangements for the Romans to take possession of the city in return for a guarantee of their safety. The head of the garrison in Tarbasium, the man who negotiated this surrender, was Ildabad's nephew, a man named Totila. Constantianus was more than happy to take the terms, 
and set an official date for the transfer of power. But before the city could be turned over to the Romans, Totila received an offer from members of the Ostrogothic nobility. They wanted him, the nephew of Ildabad, to take the crown. Totila agreed, but only if Eraric were to be removed from power before the day that Terbasium was to be surrendered to the Romans. So in the fall of 541, Eraric's reign and his life came to a quick end. He had reigned for only a few months. And Totila was now proclaimed the king of the Ostrogoths. When this news reached Constantinople, Justinian was less than pleased. He had hoped that Italy would be pacified by now, but instead, the enemy was regrouping around a new king. He blamed the generals on the ground in Italy. You know, the ones who didn't have a commanding officer or a coherent plan for the war after Belisarius' departure. Those generals. And I mean, yeah, they certainly could have handled this better. But the big guy in Constantinople did not do them any favors here. The emperor sent the generals an angry letter, and they realized that they had to do something to get things back on the right track. They assembled at Ravenna and decided on an assault on Verona. And so, a Roman army of 12,000 men, according to Procopius, under the command of at least 11 generals, set out and moved north. As they approached, they got word that a Roman aristocrat had bribed one of the city's guards to leave the gate open for the advancing army. Most of the generals were hesitant, though, thinking that this could be some sort of trap. Only one general, Artabazes, volunteered to follow up on this. He hand-selected 100 men to approach the city by night and attempt to enter through the unlocked gates. The plan was for Artabazes' men to check the gates while the rest of the army followed closely behind. If the gates were unlocked, this would be easy. But if it was a trap, only those 100 men would be in danger, not the entire army. But as it turns out, there was no trap. The gates were unlocked, just as promised. The Romans entered the city, and the Ostrogothic sentinels nearby were quickly dealt with. The Romans took the guard towers, and word instantly began to spread through the city that the walls had been breached. Fearing for their lives, the defenders fled out the northern gates and reassembled outside the city to wait out the night. Verona was there for the taking, essentially undefended. But back at the Roman camp, the generals were not moving as planned. Instead, they decided that before they could attack, they needed to decide how exactly they were going to divvy up the city's riches if they were successful. The city's riches that they had not even won yet. By the time that they were able to reach a compromise on this all-important issue, the sun had started to rise and the Ostrogoths realized that only a very small Roman force had entered the gates. The men who assembled north of the city re-entered Verona and forced Artabase's men into a corner, pinning them atop the walls on the south side of the city. By the time the Roman army approached, the Ostrogoths had secured the gates, leaving Artabase's men trapped. The main Roman army retreated, and the men inside the city were forced to jump off the walls to escape certain death at the hand of the enemy. Many did not survive the fall, but a few did, including Artabase's. He retreated to the Roman camp and berated the other generals, calling them cowards. The Roman army retreated as a whole back across the Po and headed for Favencia, about 20 miles from Ravenna. When Totila heard of the retreat, he took as many men as he could and followed the Romans south. Artabazes wanted to attack the Ostrogoths as they tried to cross the Po, but the generals could not come to a consensus, and the Roman army sat in Favencia while Totila advanced without opposition. 
he caught up with the Romans in the spring of 542, and the two armies lined up outside Vivencia, prepared for battle. But before they clashed, an Ostrogoth named Valaris rode out on his horse between the two armies. He challenged any Roman to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. Valaris was apparently a huge guy, so big that the Romans were absolutely terrified of him. Only one man was willing to answer the challenge. And it was... Artabazes. Because this guy is just freaking awesome. Artabazes rode out to duel and delivered the first strike, his spear fatally piercing the giant Valaris. Because again, he is just freaking awesome. However, Valaris's spear did clip Artabazes in the process, leaving what Artabazes believed to be a minor wound. He returned to the Roman camp in triumph. Sadly though, it was worse than it seemed. The spear had actually nicked an artery, and there was no way for the Romans to stop the bleeding. Artabazes would die from the injury a few days later. But remember, this guy thought a nicked artery was only a minor wound. Because he was friggin' awesome. Anyway, the main battle followed, with some 5,000 Ostrogoths facing off against close to 12,000 Romans, according to Procopius. But Totila had a trick up his sleeve. He ordered 500 of his cavalry to loop around and attack the Roman rear. When this cavalry appeared, the Romans believed that this was a second Ostrogothic army entering the fray. They lost their cohesion and were quickly routed, fleeing in different directions. The Romans took heavy casualties, and their battle standards fell into the hands of Totila's army. A humiliating defeat. Totila's next target was Florence, and he sent Uliaris to undertake a siege. Astinius was the Roman commander in Florence, and he was soon reinforced by Cyprian, Bessus, and John. And this is the same John that had caused trouble for Belisarius a few years earlier. As the relief force approached, the Ostrogoths broke off the siege and retreated to Mucellium. The Romans sent John in pursuit, and the two sides skirmished in the nearby valleys. One of John's bodyguards was killed in this fighting, and in the confusion, word spread through the Roman ranks that it was John himself who had died. The Romans believed that they were now leaderless, became disorganized, and fled. When the fleeing men encountered the rest of the army, they told them of John's quote-unquote death, and these units scattered as well. Totila's men gave chase, killing or capturing many of them. When the dust began to settle, the Roman army had suffered serious casualties and many, many desertions, with many even turning right around and enlisting under Totila. Similarly, many captured soldiers also joined up with the Ostrogoths in exchange for no longer being held prisoner. As I had mentioned at the start of the video, the Roman army was treating its men poorly, whereas Totila promised to treat them well. And many of these men were mercenaries. They just wanted the best deal, which now meant joining the other side. After these two disasters, the dominoes began to fall. By the end of summer of 542, Urbanum, Cesena, Mons Feretris, and Petra Pertusa had fallen to Totila, who was now moving south into Campania. It had taken Belisarius years to solidify his hold on these towns and cities across Italy, but Totila had taken them back in a matter of months. Historian Peter Heather has this to say about the developments in Italy during this time. In essence, Totila's early victories reversed the strategic situation which had prevailed in Italy since the moment Belisarius unleashed his cavalry reinforcements to break up the Gothic siege of Rome. At that point, Vitiges still controlled many thousands of mobilized Gothic warriors, 
but he was forced to disperse so many of them as garrison forces in the face of the mobile hitting power of the elite Roman horse troopers that he lost the military initiative, being largely relegated subsequently to responding to whatever moves Belisarius chose to make. After the defeat and dispersal of the last viable Roman field forces available in the peninsula in 542, Totila's forces had the freedom to conduct whatever offensive operations they wished, reinforced, not surprisingly, by a large flow of recruits after the huge boost to the Gothic morale of the two victories in the field. The first two won by any Gothic army since the war began in earnest in 536. In other words, the roles have been switched. The Romans were no longer able to pick off cities and towns as they saw fit, but now it was Totila's turn to determine the course of the war. And Totila did not plan to give up his initiative. He would continue to wage a destructive war on the Romans for quite some time.